morning. Everybody ready to worship this morning? Let's stand up. Let's worship him together, all right? Here we go. Sing about our Lord this morning. Here we go. Water you turn into wine. darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you there's none like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer He's awesome in power, our God, our God. Sing that verse again. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, he's awesome in power, our God, our God, say that again, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher. awesome and power our God our God and if our God is for us then it could ever stop us and if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? Then what can stand that this morning? 
no matter what the world has. God is greater. God is stronger. God is above oh, what we get thrown. It might be a curveball this week. I don't know if it was a slider. Ben, how about you? Big, big curveball, wasn't it? <laughs> but, uh, but our God is stronger, and he's able, and more, uh, more than we can ask or think, he always comes through, right? All right. And if he, if he hasn't right now, if you're in that place where you're like, man, how come he hadn't done it for me? <laughs> Hang on. Keep praying. Don't get discouraged. God has plans. Sometimes we can't see those plans, right? Our horizon is only right here, but from God's point of view, his perspective, he knows what's coming up, and he knows what you can handle, all right? So we're glad you guys are here at Lifehouse Church. My name is Rob. I'm the worship pastor here, and if you're new uh, to Lifehouse, or maybe this is your first time, thank you guys for coming. We're going to worship through music today. We're going to open up the Word of God, and uh, we'll get you out of here in about a, a minute. No, sorry, one hour. <laughs> And maybe 15 minutes after that, I don't know. But um, if you're hungry, we're going to shake hands right now. You can go get a donut real fast, so hold you over. But uh, hey, for the next few minutes, won't you shake some hands of those around you? Find somebody, find, find a new person that you haven't said hello to and welcome them to church. We're glad you guys are here today. Forever. Come on, God. His love endures forever. 
That's right. See that? Love endures forever. That again, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned, unclean. We're singing how. My sins. He took my sins and my sorrow, and he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone, and we're singing.
your voices We're singing how marvelous How wonderful And my song shall ever be How marvelous And how wonderful Is my Savior's love And with the ransomed in glory, his face I last shall see, will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. And we're singing, I. could uh, skip the preaching and just sing all, all day. How are you guys? Uh, just me, sorry. That was not spiritual. Maybe it was. <laughs> Deep thoughts with Rob Light, right? <laughs> hey, at, the end of the, at the end of August, we're going to have a worship night on Saturday, so be looking for that. But uh, it's not just about singing. Everybody here on stage, we believe that, uh, I believe everybody on stage is a, is a worship leader. And uh, everybody out here is a worship leader. I heard uh, everyone got back. Well, well, a small group went to Brooklyn Tab last Tuesday. If you did that, say, oh, yeah, that was awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. yeah, that's all I heard. heard. And then the one thing that I heard from everybody who went, I was kind of jealous. I couldn't go. I had a previous um, meeting schedule. I couldn't cancel it. But anyway, everybody that said anything, uh, I heard, man, everybody in that room was singing to the top of their lungs. And I was like, man. That would be awesome, but I think we almost got there. I, I saw a few stubborn folk, but maybe you were saving us. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, God says we can still make a joyful noise even if you're off tune, because I, I, find, I find that to be true with my guitar playing very often. But uh, I don't know where we are. I just got lost, and so um, let me get my mind together. Hey, how about have a seat? How about that? If you're a first-time guest, uh, don't be scared, because I don't know what's going on, but uh, we're glad you guys are here. Uh, my name is Rob. Ushers are coming forward. They have a card for you to fill out today, and uh, we just want to know who is here, and if you have any questions about the church, maybe a prayer request. Man, we'd love to pray with you about those things and, uh, and help you get plugged into a good church in, in the area that preaches God's Word, and there are a bunch of them, and we're, we're blessed that you would take some time to come to Lifehouse this morning, but we're glad you're here. On your way out today, don't forget we have a free gift for you and your family, so if you go to the Connect table, it's to your left once you enter the lobby. Um, we have a free gift for you. You can just grab one and, and go. Uh, we won't talk your ear off or nothing like that. But I hope you feel welcome today. And if that's you, if this is your very first time, would you raise your hand until you get one of these cards? Thank you guys for coming. Guys, let's, let's welcome these guys to church this morning. Good morning, Lifehouse Church. Uh, my name is David Holliday. Uh, with my wife, Sarah, and our four children, we are partners here at Lifehouse. Uh, this is the time of our service where we're going to continue, um, as Rob mentioned, just worshiping God. Um, each week, Rob asks someone to, to come up here and, and stand in front of you and, and talk about um, what it is to give and tithes and offering. Um, the title that I was given in the email he sent, it was, it was pretty brief. It said, willingly, cheerfully, and thankfully. 
Um, and along with this email, when he sends it, he sends out some commentary. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some of that commentary with you. I'm going to back up just a couple steps um, because I'm asking you guys to give, but I'm going to tell you the different ways that you can give. So highlighted here on the back of the screen behind me are a couple different ways that you can give here at Lifehouse Church. When you walked in the doors today, uh, if you came through the front to the right, there's a kiosk. Uh, you can do that. And if you need some help, please seek out a partner here at Lifehouse. Um, I'm sure that someone would be willing to, to walk you through that. Um, you can also give online through our website. Uh, if you're tech savvy, you can text to give. Uh, in a few moments, we're going to have some ushers pass, uh, pass the baskets here to where you can give as well. So to highlight these three principles, and I'll, I'll go back, willingly, cheerfully, thankfully. So keep those top of mind when we're, we're discussing the giving. Um, I want to use this illustration. So suppose, and ladies, you'll get probably more out of this than the guys, uh, that it's Valentine's Day right, the holiday that's supposed to be for both, but usually women get all the gifts. Um, suppose it's Valentine's Day, and I bring my wife, Sarah, a dozen roses, her favorite roses, the ones that she loves the most. Um, she replies with, honey, these are beautiful. Thank you so much. You shouldn't have spent so much money. And I just respond neutrally with, don't mention it. Today's Valentine's Day, right? And as your husband, I have to get you a gift. How do you think she would feel? Well, this is probably pretty in step with how she would reply. She'd probably want to stick every nose up my, or every rose up my nose, thorns and all. That would probably be her response, and she'd probably fulfill it. So, what I want you guys to see here is the difference between when a gift is given and the motivation of the heart. So, what if I, when she said, Th "Honey, thank you so much. This is so kind of you." My response, rather than being, "Hey, it's out of obligation," it was something where I said. There's nothing that I'd rather do more with my money than show you through my act how much I love you. Her response would be much different. I hope they wouldn't go up my nose that time. So, you know, God's no different, guys. When we give to God, God is not concerned with how much or how little. His main focus is this, the heart that he gave you and the status of it and what is the motivation towards what you're giving how you're giving. And then those three principles, are we willingly, cheerfully, and thankfully giving what we're giving to him? So I want to share um, in God's word, in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God makes this, this very clear to us. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In this commentary, it's, it's, it's really tied together uh, as one man saying these, these three things. There's three kinds of, of giving. There's grudge giving, there is duty giving, and then there's thanksgiving. And then he goes on further to say, grudge giving says I have to, duty giving says I should, and then thanksgiving says I get to. So if there's nothing more that you take from this today, what I took from this while I was reading and praying through what I would share is, think of it, the fact that we're here today, that there's breath in our lungs, that God, the God that we've been learning about the past two weeks in Genesis, who created everything, everything you look around and see in nature, God created. We get the opportunity to give back to him because he created us, and it should be our nature to be willing to give back to him. So as you give today, please, 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 I hope that penetrates your heart. Let us go ahead and pray. Lord, our God, as we stand here today, and, and Lord, as we as we open up our hearts, um, and, and Lord, give of our, our time, talent, and treasure. Lord, I pray that we look at it as a gift, um, that, that we look at you and see the ultimate gift that you gave us in your son, Jesus Christ, and sending him to the cross, um, as we'll learn about in a few minutes, that changed everything, Lord, that we will take this time to really just give back to you and do it in a thankful, willingly, unbegrudgingly way, Lord. Lord, we pray this all in the, the mighty but precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer slave to fear. I am 
chosen me love is called my name and I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins you believe that I'm no longer child of God. I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. Sing that again. I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God.
Amen. You can be seated. Time and time again in the Bible, we are told to fear not, to be not afraid. Why? Because our God is with us. And he will never, no, never, ever leave us or forsake us. Paul told Timothy, God did not and does not give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of self-control. So glad that you're here today. My name is Mark Lacey. If you're a guest or visiting, I uh, just want to explain a couple things. And for those of you who are a congregation, I want to make an announcement. One is, uh, obviously, it's so cool when God raises up men and women to lead, to follow him in such a way that others want to follow Jesus in a greater, a deeper way. And it's such a blessing to see people growing in their faith here. Uh, I want to make an announcement. If you received the newsletter this past week or the email just kind of announcing uh, what God is doing regarding our elder interns, one of the things that our current elder team of five have been praying about for over a year is that God would identify for us, show us those men that, that qualify, that, that uh, the passages of Scripture that relate to that, that meet those qualifications, and that we see God pointing out to us and that he would intend for them to lead spiritually alongside with us here at Lifehouse Church. And I want to announce some of those men were in the first service. I believe Jesse Blanton was in the first service. Steve Faulkner was in the first service. In their service, we have uh, Jason Kreidler over here, uh, Joel Miller. If you guys would just stand real quick. Uh, because here's the thing. Our elder team has been praying. We were praying for six months at least that God would identify and show us these men. But then we invited them and their families to be a part of this process that we together would continue to observe and pray and confirm for us that this is what God would intend. At this point, we are not in, in instituting them as elders or ordaining them as such, but I want to invite you, the rest of our congregation, to see what we have been seeing, the gifts that God has given these men. Uh, John Swartz is another one down in Smyrna. Jeff Sereca, are you in this service? I don't know if he was in the first or way back in the back. You can't miss Jeff. He's like 6'8", so the only 6'8 guy here. Uh, but again, these men have been pouring themselves out serving the Lord here. And we have identified shepherd qualities. Again, I want you to observe for the next few months with us and pray with us that it would, for God's will, and hopefully in the fall we'll be able to, barring any of your objections or anyone's objections, uh, ordain them as elders to, to lead spiritually here at this church. Thank you guys. You can be seated. So uh, another uh, announcement I want to make, and, and introduction is actually uh, to introduce to you Benjamin Hankin. If you're a partner here, you know Benjamin and his, and his wife, Wendy. Uh, they come from Pennsville, New Jersey. They live in Pennsville and drive every week on Tuesdays and on Sundays and even throughout the weeks just pouring themselves out in ministry here. I have been so blessed to get to know Benjamin and his wife and Ethan and Emma, their, their children. Uh, ben has surrendered to the call of God upon his life. And it's his heart, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag, it's his heart for God's will uh, to plant a church in Pennsville, New Jersey in God's perfect timing. And so I would say that what he's defined is that God is calling him and we're still trusting God for the when, how, where, and what, and all those different details. But here's what I know, Ben. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Ben loves Jesus. He loves the word of God. You'll be able to tell that as he preaches his first, he preached his first sermon last service. This is his second sermon. Same sermon, but we're so blessed, and you will be blessed. Ben, thanks for being who you are, and thank you for preaching the word this morning here at Lifehouse Church. Would you welcome Benjamin Hankin? Mark is uh, too kind. I just want nothing more than to be a servant of God. Um, but uh, greetings, Lifehouse, and good morning. I have a question that I want to ask you to start off this time, and with so many of you in here coming back from LSM camp, so many leaders coming back from that, here's the question. How many of you are in need of rest? How many of you are tired, exhausted, and just plain spent? I know I usually find myself in this state as well as so many people I talk with nowadays. Well, today we're going to be discussing that very topic of rest. Now, sadly, for those of you who just came back, we are not going to be doing 30 minutes of application. So, but instead, I think you'll find this message uh, still just a, as appropriate. But before we get into that, let me introduce myself. As Mark stated, my name is Benjamin Hankin. My wife Wendy and I, uh, my wife Wendy and our two kids have been coming here for just over about a year and a half now. And uh, we're very uh, thankful to be partnering with you guys. Uh, you can usually find us serving across the hall in the children's ministry. 
Um, usually uh, Wendy in Tyke 4 and I'm in Kid Junior. We love working and serving with the youngest that this congregation has. Serving has always been a passion of mine. It's been something that has been modeled in front of me from my grandfather early on to the people that have influenced me now. Another part that uh, I would love to be able to share with you about myself is I am a product of those who have poured into, who have invested into me to raise me up as a follower of God. A few of those people are here this morning and our pastoral intern Joel, Pastor Mark, Steve Faulkner, Malcolm. So many people have had the chance to, to work with me and just have a chance to influence me. But there would have been nothing for these gentlemen, nothing for them to work with, if not for a couple couples that early on in my life. John and Diane Dower, from the very onset of getting to know them in our, in our young adult ministry at a church we went to previously, took a very unshaped, unmolded piece of clay. They spoke truth into me. They modeled it in front of me. They invested in my life. They even gave me my first chance to teach in a small group setting. They walked the walk here in the proverbial Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth where I had the pleasure of serving with them as well. Another couple who had a great impact on me and was able to come last service is Stan and Rita Bachman. They're the very example of what a godly couple looked like. And if you were to ask me what godly people in today's age look like, I would point directly at them. For those who were at the men's breakfast yesterday, and we, when we looked at husbands and wives and men and, and what a marriage looks like, they are the ones, the very epitome of that, and modeling it out in today's world. Wendy and I were honored to have Stan act as the officiant in our wedding, counseled us before, during, and after the good and the rough times. He, along with John, has been a spiritual father to me and has helped raise me up throughout my life. Both of these couples took the time to disciple me. And better than any verbal or written thank you I could ever give them, I want to ask you to think about who you're investing in. I want to ask how you're investing in the next generation of Christians. Who are you assisting to help come the, the, the person that Christ is calling them to be? Who are you pouring into? and helping draw closer to God. You never know what God is going to do with a person, with the person you're working with. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go and make disciples of all nations. Not just abroad, that means here at home as well. Follow the charge from Christ. Let him decide what's next. You never know what that person is going to do. You never know how God is going to use them. They very well might be the next person up here preaching a sermon. They were, very well might be the person going on the front lines in, in missions work. They very well might just be the next person going throughout Middletown, through Pennsville, through Smyrna, through Delaware, throughout the world, preaching the name of Christ. We don't know. Ours is just simply to go. With that said, I would like to thank Lifehouse again for this opportunity to be here speaking with you all. And I also want to ask another question. How many among us have been involved in some home remodel project? Whether it be a kitchen, whether it, I see some hands going up, whether it be a bathroom renovation, simple coat of paint, so many different things, or even that dreaded major overhaul. They're usually not fun, and depending upon the size or the scale of the project, we look forward to that rest that comes afterwards. That is until we remember that we own a home and there's that never-ending checklist. Last year we had an incident happen, if some of you know, to our kitchen. Our insurance agent and an adjuster both had to get involved in this due to the size and the scale of the project. Nothing went easy on this one, mostly due to the house's age, but measurements from the side to side. The floor was unlevel. Even a cabinet had to be returned in a small one ordered. And then again, my favorite part being that we have two dogs and two cats and trying to keep them from going into the kitchen and falling through the joist to the dirt below in the crawl space. Then last fall, the end was in sight. We had our appliances and a countertop delivered on the same day. We could finally start using all that food that had been sitting in those brand new, wonderful looking cabinets. We could finally cook on appliances and not that ninja or crock pot anymore. As much as I love grilling, we could use a stove. It was beautiful. Then, seemingly, the work stopped. Life got busy. School got very busy. 
so many things ended up happening. Even the lighting still needs to be done because of wiring that's not right. It was usable. It was functioning. Plumbing and everything worked. But there's a sense of completion that still lacks from not seeing it totally complete and done. Our project is, for the most part, finished. But that punch list, that stuff that needs to be done, I see that every time I walk into there, and it will not leave my head. Again, there's a constant reminder. But even after everything is done, after everything is complete, I will still have regrets. I will still know every imperfection when that kitchen is completed. I will know everything that I wish I would have done and everything that sits there with the different errors and, and whatnot that we've been able to cover over. There will still be regrets despite how well it turns out. As we move into our time in the Word this morning, I want you to keep this example in your mind. As we finish talking about the, the great work that was being done during the first previous six days, a work that was seen through from beginning to end by God, during those six days, His amazing power was on display. Light from dark, heavens from earth, land from water, in a power, a display of power that has not been seen again on this earth. Then we get into the fifth day. Animals, birds, fishes, and all kinds of other assorted beasts that are written about. I had to tell you, I was even astonished in a science report that I was looking up when I was doing some research for this. 15 to 18,000, let me say that again. 15 to 18,000 new species are identified every single year. And there is no sign of that letting up. This does not include ones that are just extinct and have gone. This includes ones that are being discovered alive and well today. For example, I know some of the women are going to love this. There was a spider that was just discovered two years ago. Yep. <laughs> it does cartwheels down the dunes to escape its predators. That, nine, that bug up there, the stick bug, is nine inches long and lives in the, canopy, the forest canopy of Vietnam. Nobody knew it was there. If we're discovering these things today, imagine what it would have been like to be there the fifth day when everything was created. The power of God completely surpasses anything we can possibly comprehend. Amen. Then we come to the sixth day. And unarguably, this day brought about the pinnacle of his creation and, brought, was, and saw man brought to life. We, his image bearers, entered into this world. As we read in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image. And so with that, we arrive at the passage that we're going to be exploring this morning. And that is in Genesis 2, 1 through 3. But before we do that, let's just, just take a moment and lift our time up to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time this morning, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word and just what the truth that it speaks to us. Lord, as we seek to, uh, to discover the truth in the day of rest, Lord, we pray that you would just speak into our hearts, speak into our minds, open up and, and allow us to hear what you have to say. Lord, we thank you again for this time and we thank you for your word. And in your name we pray, amen. amen. Let's open up our Bibles to Genesis 2. And looking at the seventh day in creation, we're going to be in verses 1 through 3. As I said during the first service, I'm going to be a little bit honest with you. We read all these amazing things that happened during the first six days of creation. All this stuff that was being spoken into life. All this stuff and rest. So if we're going to be truthful as well, I would guess most of us might skip over these verses. Or we don't even read them. Or we also know that Adam and Eve is coming up along with the Garden of Eden. And we kind of really want to get to that stuff. But something that can't be overstated is the importance of Scripture. There are no words written in this book that do not deserve our utmost respect. From the longest and most theological of verses down to the very shortest being Jesus wept. Every bit of Scripture is important. Every bit of Scripture holds some truth for us to discover. Every bit of Scripture shows us something about God. And so, with that in mind, let's read Genesis 2, uh, 2, 1 through 3. Thus, the heavens and earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in that, 
In it, he had rested from all his work with God's created. I do want to take a quick moment and share something with you. This will be the last time you guys see the King James up there. I know we're used to seeing the ESV, but I wanted to share something with you. I shared about spiritual legacy earlier. I want to share with you about family legacy. I was very honored to be able to have my grandfather's Bible up here with me this morning, and that's why we're reading from the King James, because of just the history that it has behind it. This was given to my grandfather about 60 years ago by my grandmother, and so I was very honored to be and blessed by my dad to be able to use it this morning. But as I thought how best to proceed with these verses, I decided to go and consult a great group of theologian friends. They have never failed to guide me, and they always point me to Jesus and God. As a matter of fact, every answer is Jesus or God. My circle of theologians can be seen if you go right through that door, across the hall, and to Team Kid Jr. I decided a few Sundays ago to ask their opinion on these verses. And the topic we're going to be exploring this morning, which is, does God get tired? Does God need rest? Though I'm not going to say names up here, I will share their great answers. Of the five boys, I had mixed comments though each understood that God had rested. One said, yes, he does a lot of things, and on the seventh day, he rested. Another said, on the sixth or the seventh day, he was very tired. And upon realizing they agreed, there was many hugs and high fives after that. (laughs) The remaining three said, no, he does not get tired. One said, he was not tired, He just rested from making stuff. He's God. The second stated, no, because he is God. And then the last, no. When I asked for further clarification, I got, because. (laughs) I can't argue. I brought this up because sometimes we don't give those kids enough credit. They really are picking up the truths that we are teaching them. They really do understand what is going on. It's a true joy of being a part of it, seeing them grasp the concepts such as creation and the cross. I will say, though, thankfully what we see here is not a God who is tired, but in fact something completely separate from that point. One thing I have learned is we as people need an example to follow, someone to show us the path, someone to show us what to do, or even just point us in that proper direction. We see this numerous times in the life and ministry of Christ. Here are just a couple verses from among many that speak the idea of mankind needing an example in our lives. And that is exactly what is going on here in the seventh day of creation. There is no need for a God who is self-sustaining, self-existing, eternal, omniscient, omnipresent, and all-powerful to rest. Those six days in creation could have just been a simple thought and bam! It's all there. But there is an order of all things. And each day, it was different. There was a rest, and it also included this day of rest that God set aside. That included him reflecting on his work that had just been completed. As we begin to go through these verses, I do want to let you know that there is no way in a 30 to 40 minute time frame that I could go through every aspect of this day of rest. There is just too much to it. But my goal this morning is to show you, is threefold. One, to discover the original intent in the Old Testament. The second being to show how to describe how that intent was changed. And the third, to describe how the cross redefined the day of rest for mankind. As for the original meaning and the original intent for this day, that is best left up to the scripture itself to tell us. Let's begin exploring as we look at verse 1 again. Thus the heavens and earth were finished, and all the host of them. Creation is finished. It has come to an end. Something new is about to happen. Genesis 1 was all about the previous six days of creation. And in all reality, we could group this one with it because of it being an additional day. But this word thus shows you a break in the action. It signifies a change in the narrative. Also, we see in this first verse the words heaven and earth. This is God's great work that has been completed. Not one part or another part, but in totality. I also want you to look at this word finished. 
This word finish, when we take it back to the original language, which was written in Hebrew, translates to the word kala. It gives an idea and a concept of being more than just complete, more than just done. Think back to my example of the, at the onset of this message about the kitchen. Our kitchen is overall usable, but not complete. For school, I have written papers that are done. I've written papers that are hit every point, but they're not anything I would call complete. They were done to get it in on time. The use of the word finished is something that is above what any earthly builder could ever hope to attain. The heavens and earth were complete to the utmost quality. There was nothing that could be done or added to them. There was no regrets in each aspect of it. Secondly, I want you to take a look at this word host. Now, if you're like me, when you hear this word, you might think back to the birth of Christ and the heavenly host that appeared above the shepherds. And you would not be far off from thinking this and having this as an imagery in your head. The word host translates to the Hebrew word sava. It usually refers to a division or grouping of men for military purposes, such as an army. Even Bildad grabbed this concept when his talk to Job, as we read in Job 25.3, is there any number to his armies? conveying the idea of something that is uncountable to men. But in this instance, the author is grouping the stars in the sky and all of creation on the earth, all together under this banner of the word host. We cannot simply grasp by this word the magnitude or how vast the creation looked in these previous six days, or how small in comparison we are to the rest of creation. But as they say, a picture is truly worth a thousand words. In 1990, Voyager satellite reached the edge of our known solar system. And so NASA sent some codes to it to have it turn around and take a picture. What was sent back was interesting, and this photo is that picture. It's about as in focus as one would expect from roughly four billion miles away around the edge where Pluto is. But there's something else rather interesting about this picture. See that tiny blue dot and that light ray right in the middle? There's an additional photo which points to what I'm referring to. That's Earth. We think this planet is so huge, so big, but when we see it in comparison with the rest of creation, we truly have an idea through photos like this how small we are. That God simply spoke and all things came into existence including that little blue dot and all of creation that would ever live on it. When we have examples such as this, we truly begin to get a glimpse of the enormity and power of God that wields with but a simple word. With this idea of creation being finished, let's continue on into verse 2. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. In this verse, there are a couple things that come to mind. The first being the word rep- and the repetition of the word seventh. This is allowing us as, re- as readers to understand that this day holds some importance. Twice in this verse and once in verse 3 that we'll see, this word is repeated. Repetition of words is a tool that authors and writers use to help the readers understand that something significant is about to happen. Something big is going on and we need to pay attention. In this case, we see the marking and the continuation of the week, at the, of the end of the week. With creation being completed and the, end, and the end being there, it marks an end of a sequence. This pattern continues throughout the Bible. And one such example from, the, uh, from Noah in Genesis 7-4 is, For yet seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth. Now again, this is just one of many examples that we could find if we were to read throughout the Bible. One example among many of a seven-day week continuing from that point until now. Also, I want you to remember that we're talking about the seventh day in the Jewish calendar. Their week starts on Sunday and ends on Saturday. This is important, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But prior to that, we see the tool of this repetition happening again in the word of God and the pronouns he and his. To better explain this comment and showing 
let me use another, showing what I mean, let me use another example from our home. There have been many times where we've, I have had to use this phrase, I made this sandwich, this is mine, and I am going to eat it. Through the repetition, I'm not trying to show any kind of selfishness. I'm trying to let two young children know that this is mine. Lay off. In the repetition that we see here in this verse, the author is very, making it very clear to us just who is responsible for creation. It is showing us who has ownership of it. And as was mentioned in the creation of man, we may have been given dominion over the birds, the beasts, and, the ever, uh, and everything else. We may have been given dominion over the, f- over the flowers, the herbs, and everything. But we are simply just stewards. It is his property. In this, last, in this verse, the last item to look at is the word rest. What we see here is the beginning of the day of rest. And it's being assigned to the seventh day. Though it does not bear the title here, this is the institution of, a, of a day, what would be called later in Scripture as the Sabbath day. A key to remember about this day is that it's not due to any exhaustion or need to kick back and relax. This was God stepping back from a completed work and ceasing from all other activities. On this topic, one of my favorite writers from the 1800s, Albert Barnes, writes, He rested. By this was indicated that his undertaking was accomplished. When nothing more remains to be done, the purposing agent rests contented. The resting of God arises not from a weariness, but from a completion of his task. He is refreshed, not by the recruiting of his strength, but by the satisfaction of having before him a finished good. It was done. And it was God's work that was perfect and finished. And how did God respond when he saw before him a finished and perfect work? Let's read verse 3 again. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. In this verse, I want to draw your attention to three different terms. The first one being this word, day. To understand what it means here in this context, we need to compare this day with the previous six. What is different from this day than the others? If we were to look at Genesis 1, we would see six times it goes from evening to morning. While here we just have day. That signifies to us, the reader, in the context of the passages, that he is talking about a whole day in its entirety. From that we wake up to the time that we go to sleep. That means this rest, this time of reflection upon God that he had instituted in the previous verse, is just one that lasts the length of the whole day, not just a small part. Another term that I want to discuss with you is the word blessed. This word trans back to the Hebrew word barak. This word is the same one that we see during the patriarchal time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was used to speak a special blessing upon the heir to whom the covenant would transfer to. The neat part about this word is it's an active word. The word shows God speaking a verbal blessing upon the day. I also want you to see this word sanctified, or depending upon your version, made holy. Regardless of the version you're using, regardless of which phrase it has in there, the importance is in the words or phrase that's there. This term translates back to the word kadash. And it gives an idea of being set apart. Not just any kind of set apart, but being set apart for God's work. It's a part from the ordinary service, apart from commonality. We see the same term being used multiple times in the book of Leviticus. For example, Leviticus 21.8, For I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. The thing to remember about being sanctified, or being made holy, or declared holy, is you first have to be holy to make something holy. Like the idea presented earlier of creation being finished to a degree that mankind can't achieve, the idea of making something holy or sanctifying something, yeah, that's very much beyond our capabilities. 
with the verses read and pulled apart, what should we take from it? How can we sum up these three short verses? If we pull this information together, we get these points. In verse 1, we see a summation of God's great work. Remember the word host? That is what his great work was. All of the heavens, all of the earth, as well as the stars in the sky, and all of creation roaming around this planet. Verse 2 gives us the idea of a great work being one that is a finished and perfect work. Remember that this is a quality that only God can achieve. Remember that mankind, we get things done to a certain level of being done. God gets them to the status of being complete. And because all of creation was complete and there was nothing left to accomplish, verse 3 shows us God rested. This rest that God shows us is not a laying about. This is an active rest in which there was a purpose and a reason behind it. The writer of Psalm 111 does a great job of explaining. We read, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Once again, going back to Barnes and what he writes, the highest and most appropriate exercise of memory is to retain the lessons which the works of God instill, to treasure up for gratitude and for use what he teaches his intelligent creation through those works. Memory can never better be employed than in treasuring up the truths which the Creator teaches his providential dealings with us and in his word. As the psalmist and Mr. Barnes both write about remembering and treasuring up his works, what a better day to do that than on a day that's set aside explicitly for that purpose. But as we transition out of the original day that we read in Genesis 2 to the rest of the scripture, what's next? What became of this day that God set apart for his service? As we move out of Genesis, I want you to keep in mind the original intent of what this day was intended to be. So it can be compared with what it became. And remember that this day is one of those concepts or points that travels the length of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We see it here in creation. We see it in the Ten Commandments. Throughout the history of Israel, the ministry of Christ, and even at different points in the New Testament. But for us, as we go to the next point that we're going to look at, is during the Exodus. Though we see it mentioned in Exodus 16 with Israel in the wilderness, for us, we're going to move to Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments. Here, God defines what this day is to look like. And there is no coincidence that the first word in these verses is the word remember. It's kind of funny since this is the, exactly what, this learn, what we learned this day was meant for. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. And verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. These section of verses act as a separator for the Ten Commandments. The first three relate to us, man to man. The, final six, I'm sorry, the first three relate to us in our relationship with God. The final six relate to us, man to man. But this day was so important to God. It could not get any clearer, one would think. Sit back, refrain from work, and focus on God. In fact, if you were to look at one of the meanings that is behind the word Sabbath, it gives an idea of an intermission. It shows a break in the normal routine. This is where we enter the second of my two goals for this morning. It is at this point that we see how the original meaning was changed into something completely opposite 
of what it was intended to be. It's at different points of the Old Testament that, that the requirements for this day got defined, as well as man got involved and put his own take on it as well. When all is said and done, there ended up being 39 what they called father laws in observance of this day, as well as numerous descendant laws as well that were added. But regarding the Bible and the appearance of these laws, here on the screen is a list of what the Bible alludes to some of these labors that were prohibited, that we were to refrain from or get on the day of rest, or again, as it was called in the Jewish faith, the Sabbath day. And if you were to look up each of these, you would not see this labor specifically mentioned. But the Bible in those verses alludes to it. And you can see where the activity might be drawn out from it. But as for the 39 laws in regards to the day of rest, here on the screen is a chart showing them all. Now due to the time constraints, there's no way I can go through all of them. But as you can see from this list, nothing involving construction, nothing involving har farming or harvesting, not even writing or erasing two letters. One thing that comes, from my, my, comes to mind when I look at this list is you were regulated from doing almost anything. By looking at this list, I would tell you if I was around back then, I would be more afraid of offending and sinning than it would be a restful time for me. And it does not even end there. Here are just some examples that I've read and found. If you had false teeth, dentures, you would need to be careful about how you applied them and what adhesive you would use, or you could be in violation of the law. There is even a debate today debating, uh, going around about whether it's even a, considered a burden to wear them on the Sabbath. If you dragged a chair along the dirt floor, that could be considered plowing. In the modern age of today's time frame, meaning today's date, if you turn on a light switch, that could be considered kindling a fire. Strict observers of the Sabbath would even remove the lamp from the refrigerator so that they would not kindle a fire when they opened it on Saturday. Also, some people went as far, or go as far today, as putting the refrigerator on a timer so that during the day when they opened it up, they would not put a burden on the compressor. Though some of us may laugh or chuckle at this list, and what may seem like sheer insanity to us, with man placing all these laws upon this day. My question is, how many of us do this very thing when we approach God? How many of us try to define the relationship in ways that are apart from Scripture? And we try and regulate it that way. But as far as the Sabbath day, the day of rest, and how the mankind applied the laws to it, they clearly missed the mark and what this day was meant to be, how it was meant to be observed. This was a day that was meant to be a rest and remember God. It was his day, and he rested, and we are to remember him. This clearly got away from his original intent. As we move into the last of my three goals for us this morning, which was how the day was redefined through the cross, I want to pose a couple questions to you to think about as we explore the redefinition of this day. So what changed? Why are we sitting here in church today instead of observing the day of rest on the Sabbath, which was the Saturday? I see when I look at the ministry of Christ, he observed the Sabbath. Are we called to do the same? Why are we not still burdened by these regulations in regard how, to how and when we rest? Simply put, what changed was Christ and the cross. Ethan and I were discussing last Saturday this very topic as I was preparing. And as we did, the song, The Cross Has the Final Word, came to mind. It has the final word in how we come to know salvation. It had the final word on this day of rest and how it observed it well. As far as questions may be lingering regarding why we meet today instead of worshiping, uh, on worshiping on a Sunday instead of a Saturday, to be honest, there really is no quick answer. Though through Constantine and other church councils that happened during the early church period, they came to say, that, you know what, that we're going to meet on the day that the Lord rose, which would be Sunday. Also in regards to Christ, yes, he observed the Sabbath day. He knew the law and he kept the law while he was here on earth. And the Sabbath day was just one, or the day of rest was just one aspect of it. But it was not until the death and resurrection that everything changed. That our approach to all things changed. But continuing the discussion with Christ and the Sabbath, 
In Matthew 12, as well as Mark 2, we read of him in the grain fields, plucking heads of wheat for he and his hungry disciples. This simple action broke multiple laws. So how does he respond? Well, let's read. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and all, and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? And in verse 5, Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Christ reminds them of their own history regarding David and him doing a similar act to feed his men. We also read how Christ called this, the Pharisees out on their own hypocrisy in observance of this day, moving away from sacrifices and instead showing love and mercy towards each other. Why was he able to say this? Why was he able to challenge them in this way? Let's read the last two lines of Mark's account starting in Mark 27. Mark 2, 27. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Christ reminded them of this day's original intent. Who it was created for. What it was meant to be. It was never meant to be what it did, become what it did. I can't repeat this phrase enough. It was never meant to be this way. But thankfully, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, reminds us of his position as the Son of Man, the Son of God. And that puts him over even the most sacred of days as well. But again, what took us from then unto now is the cross. Through the cross, we have a new definition of rest for our believers. Rest is no longer a day or an observance of it. It is no longer a strict set of laws that we have to adhere to. Rest comes through accepting Christ and knowing that we can place our burdens and our worries upon him. Let me repeat that. Rest comes through accepting Christ and knowing that we can place our burdens and worries upon him. Rest comes when we allow him to take the reins of our lives as believers. Rest occurs when we let the cares of this world pass. And because we are so focused on the gospel. Because it is how alone what is the focal point of our hearts, our minds, and our soul. Rest comes through Christ and the cross that we can experience now. Which one day leads to the true rest promised to believers when we stand next to our Savior in eternity. We look at Hebrews 4, verses 2 and 3. For good news came to us just as them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by the faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, and as he said, I swore my rest, they shall not enter my rest. Because although his works were finished from the foundation of this world. Israel had so many t- opportunities to re- enter a rest of time with God. And they stepped back in fear. The first attempt was in crossing the Red Sea. And that led to God's anger and wiping out a whole generation. Other points in their history saw the very same results. But we, we as believers can know that rest that was intended simply through our belief and following Christ. I do want to bring up one point. Though we are not beholden to a day in its observance any longer, meaning that we're not in strict observance of it, we don't have to follow rules or laws, I don't want us to get away from the wisdom that comes from having a day of rest, from having a time of rest. We as humans were never meant to go 24-7. Certainly not then, and even more so now. And with that, I want you to honestly think. Take a moment and think about your schedule. Think about your day. Think about your week. Think about your month. You see, we are called to give the first fruits of our treasures, 
our 10% as a tithe, as an offering to God? Should our most valuable resource, our time, be any different? Where we spend our time and what we do with it shows exactly where our heart lies. In looking at your schedule, does it show a block of time set aside for morning devotion? Does it show a time set aside for prayer? Does it hold that spot of priority in your life? Or is it something that you fit in like another business meeting? We as a nation are one of the most on-the-go, workaholic people that this world has ever seen in its history. We are connected and can have information at our fingertips. But this accessibility comes with a price. It means that we can be reached anytime, anywhere, by any person, for any reason. And that even means during our time when we are focusing and spending time with God. But I want us to take a moment and recall our points from when we were looking at the, uh, the original day in Genesis. And I want to reapply those now and redefine them as to, as in light of the cross. Since the cross redefined what rest is and how we achieve it, I want to change and redefine our original terms. Because of God's great work in bringing all people and nations to him through the perfect and finished work of the cross, man can rest because of God. In the same way, God looked upon creation and spoke a special blessing upon it by declaring it holy and sanctified. It was finished beyond what man could do. Christ came to earth, showed us a love, a side of God that was of love and grace. He showed us that we needed us something more. He changed our understanding of salvation and showed us that a path lied not through the law, but through him. And from a plank of wood that was held between heaven and hell, cried out, it is finished. God's plan was complete. And again, it was to a level that we could never hope to achieve. We could not begin to imagine that at that point. And as we close out our time this morning, I think it only appropriate to hear from the source about this very subject that we have studied this morning. Read with, me, read with me in Matthew 11, starting in verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by the Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in you for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We go about our lives suffering from anxiety, suffering from worries, and in general, we feel burdened. We feel that no one knows what we're going through, and we have no way to remove it. All the while, this book here never leaves our shelves. Seldom do we bend a knee, or never even, in prayer. And all the wonder, while we wonder why we can't find rest, why we don't have a restful moment in our lives. I tell you at times that we are no better than the old Jewish leaders back during the days when they had the laws to the Sabbath. I want to challenge you with this. In the day that was set apart for remembrance of the Lord, it was blessed and declared holy. The people of that day then added to this observance, making it something it was not supposed to be. In much the same way, God gave us his son as a gift that freed mankind from the burdens of sin. It allowed us to have a pathway of knowing and standing righteous before him. How do you, my brothers and sisters, tell God that that work was not enough? How do you tell him that there needs to be more added to it? How do you, in your life and faith, change what he intended and make it something it was never meant to be? I tell you, the pathway is simple. The pathway is easy. Because of God's great work of bringing mankind back to him, 
through the good and perfect finished work of the cross that was done in the death and resurrection of the Christ, we can know rest. Joel can know rest. Michael can know rest. Juan can know rest. We believers, we can know rest because of the cross. Nothing, nothing else needs to be added to it. We just need to come to him, plain and simple. Because again, as he said, it is finished. Let's bow our heads.